Welcome to the CBC Massey Lectures Book Launch. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers, and I'm the principal of Massey College. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here uh, at Massey College. Massey College, the beautiful Massey College, is built on indigenous land, the land of the Yorunwanda, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. I want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward this land and also the great privilege that we have to continue to do our work here and to celebrate today a great book. So I'm uh, joined here with our partners, uh, House of Anansi Press and CBC Ideas to celebrate uh, this, the, the 2021 Massey Lecture. It's a great partnership between CBC Ideas House of Anansi Press and Massey College to celebrate books that actually are transformative, uh, transformative for our society, and certainly this one is. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, introduce uh, Samara Al-Hilal, is the president of House of Anansi Press and Groundwood Books. Her prior roles included publisher at Groundwood Books, associate publisher and manager at Kids Can Press, and she also had many other uh, role in the educational publishing and freelance work. Among other things, she worked for Imagine Native Film and Media Arts Festival. So welcome, Samara. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Hello, everyone. I am professionally and personally honored that House of Anansi Press has the opportunity to share this incredible work with readers around the world. On the eve of publication date next week, there has already been extensive media coverage and comments on the ideas in this book, and there will be so much more, thanks to the ongoing work over the years of our colleagues at Massey College, CBC, and of course the incredible staff at House of Anansi Press. Out of the Sun by Essie Adujan is a major work of nonfiction, an incisive analysis of the relationship between race and art. I urge you all to read it for an understanding of the issues that face us all today. Thank you, Essie, for this incredible book. We look forward to an ongoing conversation. Thank you, Samara. So uh, now uh, let's hear from Greg Kelly, who is the executive producer of Ideas. We started as a freelancer broadcaster after finishing his doctorate in English literature from Oxford and he's won national and international awards for his documentary work in both radio and television. And prior to joining the CBC, he created and led public radio program for NPR in the United States and Radio Netherlands worldwide. It's a great pleasure to work with uh, Greg and uh, welcome to celebrate the 2021 Massey Lecture. Well, thank you, Natalie. Uh, that word pleasure, I have to say, one of the great pleasures of this job is meeting as a committee to try and hash out who could be a, an apt and appropriate Massey lecturer. And when Essie's name came up, it, it, was, it was immediate. It, it, was, it was quite um, reflexive almost. And uh, the pleasure continued when I got uh, one of my favorite moments on the job is the phone call. And uh, I was outside. Um, and uh, in the front of the house here, because working at home. And as soon as I heard Essie's voice, I was struck by how sort of calm, uh, measured, rich, uh, layered. And as, I, as, I'm, <laughs> as I'm speaking, I realize I sound like some tedious wine critic. It sounds like menu speak, a wine speak, uh, you know, salt yet vinegar, and uh, tones of leather and, and concrete, this kind of nonsense. But it's all true, it's, tr it's true. The, um, uh, and, and that conversation ended with her saying that this is something that she would like to do. So it wasn't an immediate yes, and nor was it uh, standoffish. It was this um, sort of layered response. And um, when I consider the moment that we're in now, that we're all in now, long overdue, it's ongoing, it's never quite ever going to be ending, maybe, um, of racial reckoning. And I think Essie is the perfect voice and the perfect person for this for this moment, this historic moment that we're living through and in. Um, because one, she is a novelist. And recently, Nala and I had occasion to um, do an event with Margaret Atwood and Omar Alakad. And um, the subject came up of artist as prophet. 
Like, how is it that sometimes in a work of literature, they just seem to be prescient or, or, or to be almost predictive of the future? And, uh, you know, Margaret rolled her eyes a little bit and said something like, oh, we're getting all woo woo now. But what emerged from that was if you traffic in plot and character um, as a writer, well, the world is filled with plots and characters and novelists are in that um, uh, and very li uh, literate. They read um, uh, the world in a way as, as, as literature with plot and character and story and development and so on. And it, it just seems like it's a, a fit that there should be a fiction writer for this year's Masseys. Um, and not only a novelist in general, but Essie in particular, because it's not just the fiction writer's eye to our moment, but uh, there's the historical perspective and contemporary right up to right now, this moment. It's as though there's the drone shot and then the handheld camera, um, the aerial and the ground level. Um, and uh, uh, given Essie, um, as a real person living in the real world, it's not just analysis and not just overview and not just reaching back through history and art and art history and so on, but is in the story. Um, is, you know, these realities get lived out in real life. So uh, in it and of it and around it all at the same time and not steering a middle path down these in a compromised manner, but rather all of it at once, it's this valency. And now I'm back to more wine speak because this is a very efficient and yet imaginative way to go about what it is that she has to say in Out of the Sun. Um, and just a, a note uh, on behind the scenes uh, and more wine speak, I, I, you know, it's been such a pleasure. There's that word again, um, professional and warm as he has been at every single stage of this, of this process, which is always fraught with deadlines and technological hiccups and all kinds of things. And it has just been a joy. So, um, Welcome to this year's Massey's Essay. It's a delight to have you. Uh, thank you, uh, Greg. And I think we uh, all speak with great admiration, but also actually we want to celebrate this book and celebrate this person. And uh, who else could do such a good job of interviewing Essie but uh, Nala Ayad, who, as you know, has been a, an award-winning reporter for so many years won multiple uh, three honorary doctorates, uh, won awards for her work, and also uh, her work itself speaks so much to the desire to be so uh, cosmopolitan. She's traveled widely. She reported from the Middle East for 10 years. You were a voice that we trusted so much, and we continue to admire you, all of your work. And thank you for doing, being here to celebrate this great book. I get to say a few words about SC before I let both of you have your conversation, which is Le Clou de la Soirée, which is really why we are here. Uh, uh, SC has won uh, twice the, the, the Giller Prize, and, and I think we are so uh, the Scotia Ben Giller Prize and for Washington Black and uh, Half Blood Blues. Both of them, I have to say, I had bought several copies to give to people for uh, Christmas uh, presents. So I feel vindicated uh, with, with uh, all the time. And this, I have to say, will be also uh, a book that I will want my children to read, my sisters to read, my mother to read, and everybody at Massey to read. It's a, it's a wonderful book. Uh, and it carried me through the weekend. Uh, I was thinking about you and thinking about how you were able to in a, this deliberate way, enchanting way, present some brutal histories of racism, which you know made us reflect deeply on our history, uh, on the responsibility to own up to that history that I think uh, bespeaks to our time. So uh, without further ado, I just want to say uh, we're so happy to have you uh, in, in this role, and we will want to continue to read you forever. I see. And now, so. Thank you. I, 
sorry, I cannot hear you. Nala. Nala, your audio isn't coming through somehow. Thank you very much. Indeed, there is an audio issue. Sorry about that. I unmuted myself now. I began by saying, Natalie, thank you very much for a wonderful introduction and good afternoon to all of you listening and watching here and abroad. And good afternoon to you, Essie. And first of all, a huge congratulations to you and welcome to the Massey family, to CBC Ideas family. Um, we're incredibly proud to have you as this year's Massey lecturer. And I just wanted to personally thank you and tell you what a big fan I am of, of your writing. And thank you also for saying yes. No, thank you. I mean, I was so uh, shocked and surprised and, and um, delighted to be asked to give the Massey Lecture. It's obviously um, it's a series I've been aware of for so many years um, and have so respected. And, and I was surprised to be chosen. And um, yeah, and it gave me a chance also to, to explore a few um, historical figures and uh, to look at uh, uh, racial issues through a different lens uh, other than fiction. So I'm, I'm really happy I was asked. Delighted is the word that, that we describe of, of our mood as well. But I am curious. I mean, you have won the, the creme de la creme of the awards out there for writing. To be a Massey lecturer, I just wonder, just to begin with, what, what does it mean to you? How is it different than the accolades, the many accolades that you've enjoyed in your career? I mean, it's... Um... Having you know read over the years um, so many different uh, pieces from so many different lecturers, you know, from Margaret Macmillan to Margaret Atwood uh, to you know, Thomas King, um, you know, each of those pieces was just so so different. But I came away feeling uh, enriched by them, and as though I had uh, been taken to a place that I had. Um, you know, I'd learned something new uh, and it completely, um, you know, each, I would say each of the lectures in this series uh, that I read uh, were just utterly eye-opening. And so, you know, I, I felt that this was a chance for me to work in a different, uh, in a mode different to what I was used to, um, working uh, within creative nonfiction to look at some of the, um, the racial issues that we're confronting today, and also to view some of those through the lens of historical stories that uh, perhaps we weren't familiar with, or when we were familiar with them, um, treating them from a different angle or, or discussing them um, in a different context. And this was something that, um, um, you know, it was quite different to writing fiction. And some of these stories were stories that I was um, probably not going to write in, in fiction form. And I was given a chance to um, explore them maybe in a much more uh, straightforward way uh, and an opinionated way that I allow myself to in my fiction. Yeah. yeah. You, uh, please continue. Oh, uh, no, I was just saying it's such an honor to, uh, to be in, in the company of, of the other lecturers. Um, I'm, I'm still astonished to have been asked. That's wonderful. You once said, only kind of half jokingly, that to change your font is to change your life. And I have to say, it's kind of an appealing thought, the idea that a switch of allegiance from writing in Times New Roman to Garamond would be so transformational. Uh, and for the record, I, I agree that it changes everything. But your book, these lectures that were uh, about to be treated to Out of the Sun, of course, speak to a far deeper change, a change in our gaze, a change in our outlook and in the way that we look at art and how that could change us and change society. And I wondered if you could speak in general just to how fundamental is that change that as you envision it? I mean, to me, I, I don't know that it, I can't speak to how fundamental it is, but I, I feel that it's it just, it's overdue and it, it's, it's deeply necessary. Uh, I've recently been reading a book on, um, art restoration. So just looking at how restorers go about uh, cleaning old paintings and, and, you know, what new things are brought into view uh, from that, um, you know, from, from that restoration. And, you know, I really thought that in some ways, um, that was part of what I was trying to achieve with this book is to 
look at uh, a piece of history that is, has maybe been sort of begrimed and, and covered over by time and, and forgotten, you know, that corner of the painting, uh, which we cannot see uh, because of uh, due to, to lack of care and, and forgetting. Uh, and, you know, to go in and kind of uh, massage away some of the grime so that it enlarges the picture. Um, you know, I, I was born and raised in Calgary, Alberta. I'm somebody who um, grew up with may maybe, um, I think all of our stories are, are our, uh, some of our stories are bestowed on us. So I, I had the legacy of my parents' migration, uh, but also living in the shadow of um, blackness, which in my childhood felt very much um, like this inherited American blackness uh, and not really having a sense of what it meant to be uh, African Canadian, but specifically African Canadian and coming from or living in the West. Uh, you know, at no point in the history of, of our nation um, has the population of African Canadians living in the West, um, or living in Alberta, living in British Columbia, exceeded 1%. So this is a very uh, small population. And growing up with a sense of, um, of being, you know, rooted within, uh, within the culture, but also uh, not being of it and standing to one side of it. And, uh, and and feeling um, feeling a little bit uh, dislocated. Uh, so for me, it was astonishing to go back and um, to discover the story of uh, settlers of African descent who had you know settled the, the northern uh, parts of Alberta and established townships like Amber Valley, uh, and you know to learn that these people had had existed and had lived there and had, had, I guess, settled the land, um, you know, at the turn of the 20th century, this was astonishing to me. And this was one of those moments uh, of restoration, I guess, that I'm talking about, which is just to, uh, you know, it doesn't diminish uh, the other histories of Alberta, of which there are many, but it just sort of in, gives a larger sense of things. We're, we're seeing things at the margins and at the edges. Mm -hmm. you, you do talk about the, the corner of the painting and of all the things that you could have written about. I mean, the, uh, so many um, parts of society, so many possibilities. I wonder why it is. What it, was it that persuaded you to peer into the corner of the painting when there were so many other choices? You know, it's, it seems that that has been shaping up to be my project, and it wasn't something that I consciously set out to do, uh, certainly when I was you know, leaving creative writing school, that, that this was going to be my my uh, topic. I mean, um, is it Isaiah Berlin who spoke about writers as being either hedgehogs or foxes? Um, you know, the, the, the hedgehog knows one big thing, but the fox knows many things. And I would say I, I've so far been a hedgehog, uh, somebody who's very, very uh, focused on looking at uh, hidden histories from the black diaspora. And this is probably, you know, touching upon what I was saying earlier about my childhood, just looking for a sense of, of uh, connectedness or rootedness uh, in, in, um, in Western civilization. Uh, uh, looking beyond that, um, you know, having traveled greatly uh, and, you know, being in, in, for instance, China and then starting to wonder about the history of, of Black people in China and discovering that there's been a Black presence in China since the Tang Dynasty, um, 1600 uh, or 600 AD, excuse me, 600 AD. So, you know, these things were astonishing for me to learn as well and, and something I, I really uh you know thought was worthwhile uh, to to um to explore and also to to maybe uh and and there are probably a lot of people who who have a sense of the black presence in in asia but i you know just generally speaking as i move through the world i think people that i know at least have been surprised uh by what i've been able to tell them and i think that this is something that is so um necessary to be discussing. And I think, especially within a, a contemporary context, we talk so much about migration and it feels like it's something um, that is contemporary or, or that is very uh, like a modern 
thing in, in that sense. And when we speak about black migrations, what we're usually speaking about is this, uh, you know, the, the transatlantic uh, slave trade. And we tend to sort of link all of our, our stories of, of uh, black diaspora, historically speaking, to that, you know, to, to that, um, you know, to the terrible uh, transatlantic trade. And there are many stories that I cover that, that do come out of that, but there are some that, that stand to one side of that. And, and those were, uh, I guess, equally fascinating for me to explore. And I, I do want to point out for those who have, who have yet to behold your book, that it is an exploration and that it, it is a journey. And that's kind of the beauty of it is seeing the world through your eyes and your interpretations of, of, of the things you see. And, I, and so I wanted to ask you specifically about about one argument you make in the book uh, that flawed depictions from the past, you know, ones that, for example, put an Orientalist twist on black portraiture or that perhaps might show a, a subservient twist, even though it's not actually reflective of reality in, in portraiture. That those are still valuable to contemplate. That, that we resist the temptation to keep such imagery in the shadows today. Why do you argue that? I'm sorry, you cut out for a moment for me. So could you could you ask me again? No problem. I, I apologize for that. There, there seems to be some technical issues, but can you hear me okay now? I can hear you now. Yes. Can you? Yeah, I was saying that the, the great thing about your book is that it is an exploration. It's a journey that we take along with you. And and one of the things that you you seem to argue in the book is that flawed depictions of you know, from the past, ones that might, you know, introduce an Orientalist twist or subservient twist to Black portraiture that isn't reflective of reality, that those are still valuable for us to look at and to contemplate and to take in, that perhaps, you know, that, that we should resist the temptation to, to, to push those kinds of imagery in the, into the shadows today. And I wondered why that was. You know, I, I think... Um... You know, when it comes to those depictions that we find so offensive today, um, and that in some cases are are erroneous, in some cases, um, I guess do depict uh, what was actually the case. I, you know, I think that those images, for instance, if I can maybe focus on the piece, the essay on European art, European portraiture. Um, you know, the ways that um, if somebody like a figure like Angelo Solomon uh, was depicted as, um, you know, as being a very African figure um, or very Orientalist figure, um, you know, in his white turban uh, with the pyramids behind him, um, carrying a cane with a, with a, a, a lion on it, uh, which were sort of markers of, of um, of his foreignness or his Africanness, uh, when in fact in his daily life he was a, a Viennese courtier who moved at the highest echelons of of Austrian society. Uh, he used to play chess with uh, with uh, the emperor, and and um, you know so in a lot of ways his his depiction is you know just completely uh, or somewhat belies like the actual facts of his daily life, which is so fascinating. Uh, but, you know, these portraits, this is, this, this is also part of our legacy. These are also part of our legacy. This is what we have. Um, and in looking at them, we can sort of establish uh, with a modern eye uh, how they are kind of betrayals of, of actual fact, and also how far we've come from the way that we are viewing uh, the people in those portraits. Uh, there's a kind of cognitive dissonance uh, that we feel when we are, um, you know, seeing images of somebody like Dido Elizabeth Bell, uh, who's also depicted in a very kind of Orient Orientalist uh, fashion uh, with a turban. Um, and then knowing the details of, of her life and how fraught that was and in her life in the living in the household of one of the you know greatest judges uh, of the era or um 
and I, you know, I focus on this. I, I talk about a like a Joseph Conrad, the title of one of his novels, which has the N word in it, and how there's so much sensitivity around um, around these like archaic depictions of blackness and and a question of of you know is this something that we should even have to contend with now? Uh, but I, you know, I don't feel that. Uh, outright, uh, you know, changing titles or, or canceling things is is the way to go about to go about this. I feel like we need to contend with them. We need to have these conversations around these very contentious images and and these offensive images. And and in that discussion, we can understand how far we have moved from um, from a time when those those depictions were were sort of rote and 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 um, uncontested and just you know it was just what it was um but we can also measure uh how much further we have to go uh from, from such ways of seeing things and so I, I really feel it's important um that we um continue to have these conversations uh, around uh imagery and continue to show images uh that uh, have the potential to offend our modern sensibilities, but that, you know, to, to hide them away would be to, uh, I guess maybe would maybe be a bit historically dishonest and, and also curb conversations, the conversations that we need to be having, uh, about, uh, racial progress and, um, and, uh, current injustice and, and, um, yeah, just these, these, these yardsticks. When you put your ear to the ground, how far do you think we are from having those honest conversations that we need to be having that you just discussed? You know, I was really uh, surprised and um, obviously horrified. Um, but, you know, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, it seemed like there was um, just this huge... Uh, very, very sudden, very sort of um, sweeping, uh, monumental, uh, global desire to have these conversations that, um, it, you know, that I think many people in the black community have been trying to, to have in a in a larger way, but but that hadn't really sort of, um, I guess maybe broken through uh, to the larger uh, population. And so, I mean, 2020, uh, even 2021, you know, I've been really uh, surprised and heartened by the depth of some of these conversations. Uh, of course, um, you know, there's been a kind of, um, I guess downside that certain people are perceiving about conversations that are maybe being had in a very a much more shallow way, uh, a way that doesn't feel authentic, that doesn't that's sort of virtue signaling, um, but that isn't really engaging with the matter. Uh, I feel like we're still in the th the thick of these conversations. I'm delighted that we're having them. Um, I hope that the book will contribute uh, to such conversations and. Um, uh, yeah, my, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm really surprised. I think if you'd asked me five years ago, or if you told me five years ago that this was the the place in which we'd find ourselves, I would have been um, very surprised. But it, it's been, it's been, in, it's been interesting. I feel like uh, people are wanting to to talk about this. People are wanting to do the work, uh, and and so it's um yeah, it's been. It's been heartening. Yeah. We've only scratched the surface. So many more questions for you, but I'm afraid we're out of time. So I will hand it back. Thank you very much, Essie, uh, for the conversation. We'll have another one uh, in the near future. And I'll hand it back to Nathalie de Rosier. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nala. It was a pleasure. It's a real pleasure. Thank you, Nala. And thank you, Essie. It's a wonderful book. Uh, it's, uh, it's a book that I, we all want to read and I think the point of the Massey Lecture is really to support the voice uh, that is Essie's voice this year and about the journey that she wants to take us all in. And so uh, uh, take that journey 
uh, it's, it's a beautiful journey and it's an informative one. So we look forward to continuing the Massey Lectures in years to come. And SE, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. And, and I want to thank everybody at Massey College uh, and CBC and House of Anansi for, um, for your engagement and your wonderful conversations and for uh, allowing me to uh, express my, my ideas. Um, it's been a wonderful journey. <laughs>